What worldwide trends in both education and the labor market does Africa need to respond to as it continues to evolve its educational systems? We're very fortunate today to have a distinguished panel of speakers to help us dive deeper into these questions. I'd like to start by introducing the Honorable Gaspard Twagirayezu, who is the Minister, in, Minister of State, excuse me, in charge of primary and secondary education in Rwanda's Ministry of Education. Prior to his appointment, Mr. Twagirayezu worked at the Strategy and Policy Council in the Office of the President. He also held other positions at the National Council for Science and Technology and served as a Science Center Coordinator at the Agahozo Shalom Youth Village, a model school for vulnerable youth. Next, it's my pleasure to introduce Ms. Teresa Bagaya. A principal at Imaginable Futures, Teresa Bagaya is responsible for the strategic management and execution of Imaginable Futures investment strategy in education in Africa. Previously, as the education lead for Microsoft in East and Southern Africa, she led regional teams in the, depl the deployment and implementation of learning solutions and innovations across 10 countries. As the head of Econet Education, Teresa drove the development of Zimbabwe's first digital education platform. And last, but certainly not least, is Mr. Siraj Shah. Siraj Shah is the lead for the Regional Center for Innovative Teaching and Learning at the MasterCard Foundation. He's responsible for the implementation of partnerships between the center and various governments and ministries of education in Africa. He's currently aligning EdTech entrepreneurs from various countries in Africa with the governments of Rwanda, Kenya, Ethiopia, and Ghana with the view to scale up technology innovations to improve teaching and learning in secondary education. On behalf of the entire audience and the next Einstein Forum, I'd like to thank each of you for joining us today and sharing your insights and expertise. A quick note of housekeeping for our audience. We do have a series of predetermined questions to guide our discussion, but we'll try to make time at the end for a couple of questions and answers. I'd encourage you to submit your questions through the Q&A function on the right side of your screen. And without further ado, let's get right into the discussion. Our first question focuses directly on the subject of access to education. Millions of children have had their education interrupted as a result of COVID-19. Many children will not be able to return to school until after the lockdown is lifted, while others have dropped out of school because of COVID-19 and may not return even after the lockdown is lifted. What are your recommendations to get students back into the education system? And Teresa, I'm wondering if you can start us off. Thank you, Anne. It's a pleasure to be here with you all this afternoon. And certainly thank you to all who are joining for this incredible and important discussion. I think fundamentally in front of us, we have this an opportunity to really ensure that we have an inclusive recovery phase as we reopen schools across the African continent. And as such for me, when I think about what building back better means, it certainly focuses on five areas. Amongst them is financing, well-being, equity, focus on community, something that we've seen time and time again come through for us, and certainly on teachers. And I'll speak through um, each of these five elements just to elucidate a little bit further. The first of which is education financing. We understand that this will prove all the more challenging as global donor funding in education sector declines. Not only that, but our governments are dealing with a number of national priorities, whether it's the economic impact of the pandemic to a focus on our healthcare system and in Kenya, um, focusing on the looming strikes by our doctors. But nonetheless, we know that in order for our schools to reopen in a way that adheres to safety and health standards, we will need to adequately support and fund our education systems to reopen. In addition to that, I think it's really critical that we focus on what's happening with the non-state sector. Globally, this sector accounts for nearly 25% of children not within the public education system. And so if they're not supported, will our public sector system be able to adopt every single learner that now shifts into our current education system? 
And so from a financing perspective, I think we need to ensure that both by policy and regulation, we're adequately funding and supporting for our schools to come back to reopen with the necessary support that, they, that is required. Another key component is certainly well-being. Um, we've seen during this pandemic that schools are not simply walls within which learning and education takes place, but rather are places for protection, places for food, uh, food and feeding programs, places that actually adhere and provide a number of provisions, uh, social provisions for children and oftentimes their families. And so as we think about reopening, it'll be important that we focus on the well-being of learners beyond simply just education and outcomes, ensuring that as we in enforce and support more of the provisioning of these services, um, that families are further encouraged to actually send their children back to school. Another component for me that is critical is that on equity, particularly with the lens on gender. We've seen that young girls have faced an incredible and negative cost in this pandemic from sexual abuse to teenage pregnancies to early marriages, and even or simply more care responsibilities in the home. As we reopen our schools, do we have trauma-informed care and, and personnel to support young girls as they enter back into school? Are we creating means for financing to ensure that families can afford and, and not prioritize their male child uh, as opposed to the female children in their families? And more importantly, we'll need to really hone in on public, public campaigns from community level all the way to public sector to ensure that returning to school is a rallying a cry for all of our communities and all of our learners. One of the most important things that we've seen in this period, in this pandemic, has just been how incredibly important communities have been, how they've shown up for one another, a shining example of hope in a period that's been incredibly difficult for a number of individuals and families and communities. And so as we reopen our schools, what more can we do to engage communities? What more can we do to support parents in engaging in their, in their children's learning at home, within clusters, and at school? And then the last of which, uh, last but not least, is certainly how we support our teachers. I think certainly we've missed an incredible opportunity to use this period um, to train and upskill our teachers. Nonetheless, it's not too late. How do we think about the provision of training, of professional development, whether it's peer-based, taken, tech-enabled, for teachers to really serve um, in a way that is supportive of learner outcomes, but also supportive of the whole child in these schools? And not only that, but really emerge as change makers, um, as the front line of what is needed in our education systems, and to also hold uh, our governments to account. I think we can't continue to innovate around education, around the problems that we see today, if we're not willing to invest and focus in on our teachers. So as we build back better, let's build with equity in mind, let's build with our teachers, let's finance uh, the sector, let's focus on the whole child, and let's build with community. I'll stop there. Thank you so much, as Teresa. That was such a fantastic introduction to our topic, in particular, the comments about um, institutions and educational systems as places of protection is something that I think we're all experiencing around the world and thinking about how we can ensure that as we bring students back into the classroom, they are indeed being seen as, as whole beings and we're really focusing on the many supports that educational systems can provide to our students. I'm wondering if any of the other panelists would like to comment on this subject before we move on to the next question. Uh, yes. I can. I love it. Uh, so, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you're tuning in from. It's really great to be on this panel. Um, Teresa, fantastic. And I believe, Teresa, you could go on talking about each of those topics that you've said until we create these sort of blueprints and portfolios to go back. I want us to sort of pause a little bit and kind of take a few steps back even before the pandemic happened that forced you know, children to stay away from school. Even before the lockdowns, which was caused by the pandemic, access to education has always remained a challenge. Um, you know, much as enrollment has increased over the years, they don't necessarily translate into learning gains. Now, with almost you know 95% of children out of school due to the closures, and these are you know figures from the UNESCO sites, uh, as as Teresa mentioned, this has led to massive loss of learning, which has further impacts on 
gaps in equity, permanent dropouts, reduce, reduce transi transition rates, uh, as well as you know, gender disparities. So I wanted us to sort of view the past as well as the present, that even when, without the pandemic, we weren't doing great when it came to sort of you know, education for the right outcomes. So that combined, as Teresa mentioned, and all the various um, points she mentioned, is, is this is a chance for all of us, all of us. And this is not just the government's job, it's us as parents, us as civilians, anyone who's interested in improving the states of our countries for the you know, better of our future. We now, this is a good chance for us to look at all these various uh, facets that uh, Teresa mentioned and use this as a reset. Thanks. Thank you very much. So for our next question, I'd like to look at some of the system level changes that might stem from our experience with COVID-19. So a nice segue from the, for the blueprint for education as Siraj just mentioned. And Gispard, I'm wondering if you can tell us from your perspective about some of the fundamental changes that we can expect to see in education systems, especially as Africa continues to recover from the pandemic. Thank you, Anne, and uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, I think uh, uh, Teresa and uh, Suraj have actually set the stage uh, very nicely, uh, talking about all these challenges that we face uh, in our education systems. Uh, but I will begin by saying that uh, I think, in my view, that the biggest change uh, is going to actually be our ability to think differently about our systems. Uh, and this is something that I hope that we can uh, learn, and this is something that we can pursue as uh, the people in charge of uh, these education systems. Uh, because as you know, when the pandemic hit, so the idea of uh, having, uh, I think Teresa was mentioning it before, four walls and you have a teacher, you have textbooks. So I think when the pandemic hit, this, idea, this very idea was challenged. So uh, we call the schools, all the students went back home. So, and now the biggest question was, how do we keep learning going? Even if the kids are not at school, the teachers are at home. Uh, and I think most of us uh, found ourselves in a situation that's not familiar to uh, all of us. So now we started to think, how can we make sure that we have content uh, that's adapted for uh, this situation, right? So how do we have teachers who are, uh, uh, who are literate, uh, who have that ability to actually be able to deliver on these programs. Uh, and how do we have all the required tools to make sure that we deliver this content uh, to the students? So, and then uh, this became an, an area where I think most of our education systems were not uh, prepared for. Uh, so, but in Rwanda, uh, when the pandemic hit, so we, we had a chance to build on existing uh, policy frameworks that we had. Uh, for instance, we have what we call ICT in Education uh, Master Plan, so which is a plan uh, to ensure that we, it, that technology is part and parcel of uh, the business of education. Uh, and this framework actually leverages on other investments that the government of Rwanda has put uh, in, uh, in technology uh, and connectivity. So, uh, which means in most of the cases we had um, a modest starting point, uh, if I may say. Uh, so we had uh, different programs that would deliver computers in schools. We, had, uh, uh, we have uh, network coverage almost across uh, the entire country. Uh, and luckily in education, we had actually started to build this online, online learning platforms. So we had uh, different platforms for basic education, uh, sec primary and secondary, and we have other uh, platforms for uh, higher education. So we had that, uh, but we found ourselves that we needed to strengthen the content to make sure that uh, we, we had content uh, that's adopted uh, to uh, everyone. But also I also want to mention something about partnerships. Uh, we had a policy framework in place uh, in some of the uh, some of the cases we had also some of the content and everything but uh, we realized that we can have all of this 
but access to that will still be a challenge, right? So we, this is how we started partnering with, uh, with telecommunication companies to make sure that uh, all these sites are zero rated so that kids at home can access them uh, uh, at, uh, for free. So then we started uh, also interacting with uh, different partners like the MasterCard Foundation where they had like all these new ideas of this uh, uh, tech entrepreneurs who were trying this idea. So we said, let's try everything that we can to make sure that our kids have multiple avenues that they can use to make sure that they access uh, this type of content. Uh, and so this is what we did uh, online, uh, but then we quickly realized that not uh, many of our kids had access to computers and connectivity. So then we tried content for TV, right? So, but obviously this is not also universal uh, in, in our country. So, and then we also said we need also content for radio because now radio is, uh, is now more or less uh, uh, available in many of our households. So, uh, and then we started the training our teachers on how to record content for radio. Uh, and then we had, uh, uh, we have digitized uh, most of our curriculum in, uh, uh, in basic education and also at, uh, at university level. So they had almost uh, all the, all the, the content uh, developed for online. So now, uh, we had the content, uh, we had uh, some of the delivery uh, channels, uh, we had some of our partnerships, uh, and then the remaining piece of the puzzle, which is actually very important, was to ensure that that content is being used, is being consumed. So, uh, and then we started the different campaigns, even if we were, we were on lockdown, we tried different avenues to make sure that the kids are at home, uh, to make sure that they are be, being given access uh, because uh, you may have all these tools at home, but may, sometimes they are being used by parents or by uh, older brothers. So, so we made sure that uh, the parents uh, could actually hear that message from us and saying, you know, uh, these children are at home, but this is not a vacation. So we expect them to, uh, to keep learning. And when they come back to school, we expect them to, uh, to would have followed. So, now we started this campaign to make sure that the kids are given, first they are given access, and second, they are be given the help that they need. So, but uh, obviously, uh, 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 Teresa and Suraj were actually talking about this equity uh, principle. So now, all of this that was done, uh, we also found that, but we also knew that uh, uh, not everyone was uh, having this uh, access to these tools. So now we did everything, but we also uh, started thinking ahead, thinking about the reopening. So when we go back to school, uh, we should go uh, and keep going, but stronger than we were before. Uh, so now there was this uh, discussion on uh, remote learning, how education was going to be changed, is going to be changed forever. But I don't think this is a binary debate. So it's not, uh, it's either uh, remote learning or in-person learning. So I think we need to keep investing in both and make sure that both avenues are, are strong and they are, can be used uh, in a more coherent manner. So uh, in Rwanda, we started uh, yeah, in June, uh, we started a, a big project to build uh, more than 20,000 classrooms. Uh, and this is to make sure that we, uh, we reduce overcrowding in existing schools, uh, but also create uh, almost more than 600 uh, new schools uh, to reduce the distance that's being traveled by learners. Uh, and uh, this project is going to be completed actually this month. Uh, and so that uh, uh, from January, we can start using all these classrooms. So. Uh, we did this to make sure that um, uh, when we go back to school, uh, we will have a fewer numbers uh, in uh, in each classroom. But we also we have learners who are travel who are not uh, who are traveling uh, a lesser distance. So, and this is all. It's in a bid to, uh, if I may, come back to what Suraj said. Uh, 
when uh, the pandemic hit, we were not doing great in our education systems. And this is not Rwanda, it's, it's actually all over the world. We're not doing great. So, but we want to make sure that when we, when we, when we come back, uh, we will have actually worked on some of these parameters that we think were hindering our progress uh, and including uh, the uh, overcrowding of classroom, classrooms and this uh, uh, problem of access where kids would just drop out of school because they cannot cope with uh, the distance uh, that they were traveling. So uh, these are the things that, that, that we have been doing and to make sure that we have, uh, we have, uh, we have access, um, but we also try all these new uh, ways of teaching. So overall, uh, I think that uh, the impact of COVID-19 uh, has been um, uh, in many sectors, but the impact is even more felt in education because uh, if we are having problems now, if these problems are not addressed now, we will have even more problems in the future because we have a generation of kids who will not have been uh, very well educated. So this is something that uh, uh, I guess uh, People may uh, say, you know, kids are going back to school, that's fine, but we need to make sure that uh, we strengthen our education systems to make sure that they are resilient enough so that we can um, not only uh, uh, prepare them for another problem, uh, but also to make sure that the kids are actually learning. Uh, and we need, another thing we found is that we also need to be very flexible. Uh, we need to be ready to monitor what's happening uh, in our learning spaces. We need to be able to trace uh, the root causes of the problems, but we also need to be able to quickly react uh, because this is not something that has been a strong suit for uh, everyone in our education systems. Uh, we tend to always uh, uh, sit down, understand the problem, uh, research about it, write papers about it. But I think we also need to develop this agility, this ability to look at the problems and then be uh, quickly, uh, be able to quickly uh, adapt. So uh, I will end on this note. Uh, I think I think that the biggest mistake that we can make um, when you are trying to build this new resilient uh, uh, systems is to not look at the lessons that we have learned uh, during the pandemic and the lessons that we keep learning and then see how we can use these lessons to solve the problems that we already had uh, in the systems that in, in our systems before uh, and uh, as much as you may solve uh, the issues of access you may solve the issues of uh, 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 building infrastructure but you also need to make sure that once we have all these tools they are being used to raise outcomes for our children. Because at the end of the day, uh, these children that we have in our care, um, they, they are looking to us and to make sure that we give them what they need to be able to, uh, to strive in this uh, ever-changing environment. So I think it's our assignment in our, uh, uh, as educators to make sure that we uh, we put in place different mechanisms uh, to make sure that uh, these kids uh, are being the best uh, that they deserve. So uh, all in all, I think, uh, again, I'm going to begin uh, to, to end where I started. I think uh, the biggest change is going to be our ability to think differently about our systems. And this is something that I hope we can all have. Thank you. I will end there. Thank you very much for sharing the multi-pronged strategy from the government of Rwanda. I'm wondering if any of our other panelists would like to comment on this or if we should move on to the next question. Good. Okay, so I'd like to shift the discussion towards ed tech or ICT in education. I see that we've already received a question from our audience on this subject. EdTech has been championed by a lot of people, but also disappointed many during the pandemic. And so I have two questions for our panelists on this subject. What were the structural challenges that EdTech companies faced going into the pandemic? And what do you see as the future of EdTech on the continent? And Siraj, can you start us? Sure, sure. Thank you. Um, so, well, excuse me for playing the sort of devil's advocate. I'm, I'm not sure I would say EdTech disappointed most of us. 
definitely um, edtech interventions didn't reach all the learners out of school. So, you know, let's, let's examine some of the reasons why. First of all, when the first cases of coronavirus were detected in the countries, schools and learning institutions were closed almost overnight. That meant that students were sent home. And in this scenario, most in most countries, it was difficult to reach these students because they're on how these, um, you know, how to reach the caregivers or the parents uh, to continue learning by the tech companies. Many of the tech organizations uh, we found had to increase their marketing efforts through traditional media channels, their own networks, but sometimes they did succeed with some of the governments. I'll give you a few examples. There's an organization called Lightmore. It's an edtech company based here in Kenya and one that is supported by the Mastercard Foundation. Um, they develop bite-sized instructional videos that can be downloaded once and then view, reviewed offline. Through their intensive marketing efforts, they saw that their download numbers raised from a few hundreds in a month to over a hundred thousand the first month of So. You know, yes, while we talk about millions and 100,000 may not scratch the surface, but it was still kind of getting into the right direction. Uh, we have another organization here in Kenya called Kitabu. What they did was they started aligning themselves to the school heads um, association, some of the other associations, and then reached out to 24,000 schools in preparation for schools reopening and, and preparing the schools to sort of take on sort of technology-based learning. Um, if you take the South African government, they enabled an, another organization called Siapula to, to sort of, you know, target all the students that are out of school to sort of go onto their platform. And th this company is well on their way to reach a target of 1 million questions on maths and sciences through their interactive platform. So while, while there was, you know, no reach, there was still uh, another different ways to reach uh, the students uh, different ways. Another kind of structural challenge, and which has been discussed already by Teresa, by Honorable Gaspard, is that of access to technology by the majority of students when they're at home. And by access, I mean the acquisition and affordability of devices, and in a lot of cases, the internet. Many of the governments did, as, as Honorable Gaspard said, even in uh, Rwanda, you know, broadcasting lessons were started through TV and radio channels. But even those fantastic efforts left so many students out because those devices were simply not available at home. This, this is mostly true in the rural care uh, areas of the countries or even disadvantaged neighborhoods in the urban areas. However, if you look at a flip side of some of these emerging edtech solutions that are trying to overcome the challenges of equity, I have two prime examples. They're both based in Kenya. One is M. Shule and the other one is Eneza. Again, two, diff two organizations are supported by the foundation here in Muscat Foundation. Their solutions work via simplest of forms, uh, feature phones, uh, with SMS kind of uh, revision learning. If you take Eneza, for example, um, they, they used to charge three shillings, which is like three US cents a day for unlimited, asking a qu question to teachers and revision uh, exercise using a feature phone. Again, it may not reach all the students, but it did fantastic. And the other thing they did was, and this is something that uh, Honorable Gaspard also talked about in Rwanda, where the telcos, came into play. Uh, Safaricom, the sort of um, mobile operator here in Kenya, partnered with Eneza to avail free access to the Shupabu platform. This is the Eneza's platform, uh, which enables students to ask teachers questions and get responses as they revise. Um, this saw Eneza's kind of questions being asked. They used to average around 2,000 questions a day. This rose up to 200,000 questions a day when this platform was being accessed for free. So, you know, there are some breakthroughs uh, and some organizations that have challenged the status quo and gone around the challenges to provide, you know, education technology solutions. We're not all there yet, but there's still some fantastic uh, lessons to be learned from these. And a third challenge, um, which exists in some of the countries, is where 
either the national education or content regulators disallow edtech companies to promote educational content unless it has been approved. While I don't see that as a problem, uh, you know, I do see the importance of ensuring quality content sort of, you know, so a lot of times aligned to the national curriculum. Often these processes take too long and are expensive and these costs are borne by edtech companies. So that, that is another sort of challenge that perhaps maybe governments need to now look at in during the school closures because of COVID and going forward, how to streamline some of these processes. So more and more edtech solutions uh, are vouched for and can you know parents feel comfortable sort of using them for their uh, learners, their students. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you so much, Suraj. Teresa, can you contribute to the discussion and perhaps with um, a view towards the future of ed tech on the continent as well? Sure. Um, and what I want to start with is lessons from a report that we commissioned in 2018. And so we've looked across the globe and identified countries that had showcased significant foundation building towards equitable ed tech, which had scaled to encompass a majority of their countries. And in this process, we identified China, Chile, Indonesia, and the United States. So there were a number of commonalities across all of these markets, which um, essentially were telling us what is the way forward as we think about the onus on governments, on entrepreneurs, on funders within the space to really create a more viable ed tech market and ensure that this element of equity um, is certainly critical and encompassed in this scale. And so what we learned were essentially four items. One is you need the proper infrastructure. You need to have the necessary enabling infrastructure, whether it's all the way from electrification to telecommunications to broadband and the hardware itself. Unless this is foundational, it will be impossible for ed tech um, initiatives, innovation um, to really flourish in a market. And we know in our continent, I know um, certainly Suraj's uh, perspective is that we haven't been disappointed because we continue to see innovation. I would say we would see more innovation, we would see greater adoption um, did, were we to have some of these elements that I'll highlight. Um, another component was also on just the market uh, capabilities in, in Africa or in Sub-Saharan Africa. And so as we look here, we know that families already spend anywhere between 20 to 30 percent of their annual household income on education. And so when you think about shifting that to now affordability of additional um, access to tools, to devices, to content, you're asking that much more of families. And so where does the onus lie for actually supporting and funding some of these initiatives um, is one of the queries that we have. And so as entrepreneurs struggle to understand the market dynamics of what works and what might, might be a future, I think a critical component has really been the role of government, of clear procurement policies that enable and partnership with ed tech entrepreneurs that enables them to actually succeed and create a market. So unless you found and create and um, scale a market for entrepreneurs, unfortunately what we'll see is more ed tech entrepreneurs shifting to other industries. And that is a significant loss for us. So what can our governments do to create a more viable opportunity and landscape for our entrepreneurs? Um, the other of which, uh, and I think this is a really critical one, is simply around this, the support, whether it's financial or it's human capital. Now, in the Africa region, we know that only 3% of venture capital funding goes to the education sector, of which EdTech is even a smaller percentage of that. And yet globally, it's a quarter of a trillion dollar industry, and we're not funding or financing it enough. So I think a lot of the things that we've seen is our entrepreneurs doing what they can. Um, however, it is a truly difficult market. And I think one of the most um, the critical takeaways that we've seen from this period is the element of um, inequity that the digital divide has shown us. Usawa, Usawa Agenda in Kenya, which is a research organization, highlighted that only 22% of learners in across all of our counties have access to online learning materials. 
And whereas most are accessing through broadcast, whether it's radio or television, there's still over 50% who have access to none of these tools and platforms. And so we really have to ask ourselves, how are we building the foundation for the future? The reason I think we were disappointed, I think the reason why we've seen so much dis- um, di- uh, inequalities has been because we simply didn't build the foundation. And so now that we know this, let's ensure that we are putting forward the necessary policies in place, that we are engaging with public sector and private sector individuals and innovations and entrepreneurs to ensure that we're not in the same place should we have um, not only a, a pandemic, but opportunities for us to really engage learners and meet learners where they are. Because ultimately technology is a tool that can be utilized for good. It is a tool that can be utilized to connect, to unite truly in unprecedented ways. But if we don't pay pay attention into ensuring that it's democratized, ensuring that it truly is flexible, that it is affordable to learners, what will happen is we will have a divide of those who learn and those who do not purely based on those who have and those who don't. And I think that will be an incredible shame for our continent. Thank you so much, Teresa. I think that's an inspirational vision for the future of ed tech across the continent. Um, The next question sort of continues on the theme of ed tech and technology for education. Um, And Siraj, I'm wondering if you can speak to us a little bit about some of the lessons learned in terms of ensuring that teachers and lecturers are adopting technology in the classroom and comfortable with using it. So I think, not only were students caught out by the you know uh, lack of the loss of learning but i think teachers themselves are also at a loose end where they were would have liked to continue some sort of remote learning but simply did not have the means uh, some of the ones that i've already uh, reached out to is you know how to connect with the students already at school but even the devices or even the know-how uh, so as now countries fast track their e-learning strategies and something Teresa mentioned was very interesting Uh, she said it's the pandemic and and I want to add on to this next year it may not be a pandemic some some countries may go through uh, you know ravages of war that forces uh, students to stay at home Um, another year will have um, natural devastation that forces students to stay at home for you know months on end or weeks on end again resulting a lot of loss of learning So the e-learning strategies are something that I think, I believe I want to say every government is now putting their heads together to say, we need to come up with e-learning strategies. But as they do that, let's bring back the teachers and lecturers into this this conversation. I think the first point of action of all these e-learning strategies would be to upskill teachers in parallel to even as they kind of design the device, et cetera. I accept uh, Teresa's point that you know more than 50% of students tend to have not have the relevant technology, whether it's radio, TV, phones, computers, internet, etc. But even as that cog kind of is developed into how you know we will reach, the very critical point is the teachers and lecturers. So I'm going to suggest a few things here. One is to you know increase their literacy. So there, there are several levels of learning when it comes to technology. What is basic digital literacy? Can teachers use devices to understand how to use technology and um, the internet, etc.? Then there's a second level of training where it is, you, you, know, you kind of put your social media off using devices on the side and say, how does integrating technology in the classroom kind of work? So that's a, like a middle level of uh, you know, literacy required and skills required. And the third one is the one of e-learning. Look, it is one thing to be able to successfully use, whether it's a smartphone or it's a actual laptop uh, and the internet, but it's completely another set of skills to be able to remotely run a classroom, which is required in e-learning. So that also level of training is required. And I think these need to be put on a priority level. The other thing, even as those things are happening, some of the other things we've seen in the the times of COVID is a lot of the edtech solutions started adapting. And we can still do that as we go into, you know, uh, developing our e-learning strategies. 
let's adapt to the devices that teachers possess. I don't know the stats here right now, but most teachers have at least a feature phone, if not a smartphone. So how about if we develop continuous teacher professional development uh, to train teachers, for example, by a smartphone and use WhatsApp as a, as, as a platform, or if they only have feature phones that we try an SMS-based learning. I know of one edtech uh, company based out of South Africa, it's called Insel Education, that is now doing continuous teacher professional development based on the teacher training curriculum in Kenya and Ghana, uh, using these kind of methodologies and teachers will just access that training with whatever device they have. So we, we're not sitting and waiting until, you know, they get a higher end device, but kind of use what they have. And the third point I'd like to, you know, sort of, uh, suggest that maybe Honorable Gaspard can talk about this as well from his point of view, is even as these strategies are putting in place, what's the incentive for teachers to adopt technology into the classroom? Uh, I think this calls for a kind of some sort of policy change, you know, where not only should continuous teacher professional development be conducted via digital platforms, but also teachers should be able to demonstrate maybe a minimum amount of teaching using technology to either retain their licenses also, or also tie that to some sort of promotions. So I think that's also very important. And I'll, I'll stop here. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, would any of our other panelists like to comment on this or should we move on to our next question? The only other uh, thing I would add, um, apologies, Gaspar, um, is we often vilify our educators. Um, we call out the lack of education attainment or education outcomes from our learners as a fault of our educators. And yet we are not adequately supporting them. We're not paying them well enough. Um, and so, and we're not training them. And yet at the end of the day, when push comes to shove, they're the ones who are held to account for the lack of learning outcomes that we see. And so understanding this, understanding how critical teachers are to classroom success, to student success, it's critical that we continue to invest in our teachers and um, hold them as champions in our classrooms, in our communities, as opposed to those who are vilified for the lack of progress that we're seeing. And I think it's time that we change that narrative. Very important point. Gaspard? Uh, yes, I would just want to quickly comment on uh, uh, the question that was asked before about what are the incentives for uh, the teachers to use, uh, uh, to use technology. So I think uh, what you have found is that the teachers actually naturally want to use technology because uh, if, we, uh, if we do it right, and then technology will actually have, uh, uh, for teachers, will have actually some of the benefits because it may reduce actually on the amount of work that they have to do, uh, to do, at, to do at home. So it may uh, actually ha let them uh, take the work where they go. So if, they are, if their phone is now their primary tool of teaching, then it's a phone they have everywhere. So they can do all these things uh, wherever they go. So uh, we have found out that uh, this is something that they naturally want to do. Uh, so now the question remains uh, on our side. How do we make sure that we uh, we build uh, platforms that are um, uh, that are easy to use and that are also adaptable to uh, the devices they have, uh, as Suraj was saying? So, uh, but again, uh, there is also something else we are in Rwanda, something that is we are in, in investing in, is to make sure that we train these teachers uh, very well. So Teresa mentioned it. Uh, so we want to make sure that we build uh, partnerships uh, so that uh, the teachers uh, or the future teachers who are in training uh, uh, receive proper training. And by the time they graduate, they will have uh, digital skills that are certified. So they will have that certificate to say, you know, uh, I not only can I uh, use uh, some of these uh, technologies, but I can use them to teach. So training is very important. Uh, building platforms that uh, uh, teachers would like to use that reduce, or, uh, you know, the overhead work that they have to do at home and, and all these things. So it's very important. Uh, and also, uh, Suraj mentioned it a little bit on, uh, it's on, uh, 
uh, how we tie the their use of technology to other benefits that you receive. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is not uh, just a way to to tie them <laughs> to something, but it's to to try to incentivize them to tell them, look. Uh, now that you want to use technology, but you can also use it to advance yourself in your career. So uh, we have been developing this continuous uh, professional development courses, uh, and we want to make sure that uh, we reduce on the amount of uh, all these trainings where uh, that happen outside of the schools. So we want to make sure that the maximum of the training actually happens within schools where teachers who are friends the peers can help each other but where also the uh, a teacher can take uh can keep learning even if they are they are not 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 in school so now these cpds will be used to get these teachers promotion uh we have laws that allow for allow for different ranks of teachers so now uh cpd will also be part of that because we want to make sure that uh uh, they are incentivized enough to, if they use technology, uh, they need to feel like it's something that they need to use, they, that eases their work, but also something that will help them advance to the next level. So this is, um, these are some of the things that I can cite from a package uh, that we have been working on, uh, but we truly believe that uh, the teachers should come first when it comes to uh, introduction of technology. So. We think that this uh, teacher first uh, policy, uh, when we are equipping schools with computers, when we are giving out some incentives, when we are uh, buying connectivity for students, so we want to make sure that the teachers get access to that first and in, in a sufficient manner. Uh, because we have found out that uh, there are some areas that would have computers, uh, maybe enough for. Uh, I don't know, 100 students who can come in a computer lab, uh, but the same rich, I mean, but the teachers will not have enough devices. So now if a teacher does not have a device or is not incentivized enough to, 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 to use technology, then the students will, will not also benefit from that because the teachers will not feel like they need, they can teach using technology. So now the computers uh, uh, would not be used you know, at, uh, at their optimal level. So now we want to make sure that uh, we adapt this uh, teacher first uh, thinking uh, to make sure that the teachers are comfortable enough to use technology, to make sure they are given the right tools to use for technology. And then we are confident that uh, those skills or uh, this environment will trickle down to, uh, uh, to the students and then they will be able to uh, we will be able to efficiently use all these resources that we have. So this is a very long way to say, yes, teachers matter in this, uh, in this, and we have to begin by teachers always. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much to all of our panelists for those remarkable contributions on the important role of ed tech, both now, but also for the future of education in Africa. Um, I would now like to shift our conversation a bit to the critical intersection of education and the world of work. Uh, and this next question is for all of our panelists. So can you share your perspectives in terms of the future of education globally and in particular in Africa, but especially with reference to the changing dynamics of the workforce? Um, and Teresa, can you start us off? Sure. I'm happy to, to elucidate a little bit further on our own views and my views on where we're going as we think about young people and the future of um, workers and the future of work. And I think one of the, the critical things that we've seen is um, certainly looking at the youth demographics in our continent where we are 60% of our continent is under 25. In by 2050, 2030, we're anticipating that 42% of the global youth population will be African. Um, and so I think it's really critical that we think around what are the competencies, what are the skills, the mindsets that young people need to flourish, um, not only in work, but in their own livelihoods. So what does meaningful livelihoods for young people look like? And I would highlight a few different things that we need to consider. Now, um, 
One is which, uh, as we think about the world of work and the world of, of, of education, and this is one of the queries that was posed in our in the Q&A, is really what is the purpose of our education system? Do we have a fundamental understanding of what our education system is meant to achieve? And is it delivering on that promise if it's to ensure that we're providing the right skills for young people to succeed? Is that what we're seeing today in our systems? And if not, then the question really becomes, how do we accelerate reforms? Um, how do we accelerate support to the education sector to ensure that this alignment is, is there? Um, another really critical component for me, and well, I think for many of us here, is just the fact that a lot more happens in the informal sector than the formal sector. So even as we think about bridging demand uh, and supply, even as we think about skills training and acquisition, it's not simply what happens with Within schools and what happens within industry. It's what happens in the Juakali, in the informal sector, which in Kenya encompasses almost 82% of employment. By 2050, it's meant to be almost 90% of African youth are going to be working in the informal sector. And so I think we really need to ensure flexibility in what happens on ramps and off ramps and what happens in the formal and informal, both in terms of education and in terms of skills acquisition and ensuring that there is dignity, that there's accreditation, so that young people really can have multiple pathways to success in attaining the right skills, whether it's critical thinking, whether it is reasoning, whether it is communication and, and more social skills, or even entrepreneurial and leadership skills. It'll be really important for us that we no longer adhere or demand of our young people that they fit into one box, into one framing of what success looks like, but rather provide a multitude of pathways for them to truly succeed. Um, and I think in this, in this re-envisioning, what I really do want to challenge us to think about is how exactly we can support young people to ensure that our traditional understanding of education today is not what limits young people from their fullest potential, but rather to ensure that there are no dead ends, that young people can attain their skills, whether in work or out of, out of school, in whichever means that exists. And now I'll, I'll leave there. But for me, uh, when I think about young people, when I think about skills, what I want is young people who are enterprising, young people who are empathetic, young people who are problem sol solvers and change makers, um, and young people who want to add more good into this world. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Can I turn to you now, Gaspard, for some perspectives from the Ministry of Education? Sure. Uh, so I think uh, when we, we, we think about the future of education and uh, how it relates uh, to uh, the Africa that we want. I think we, we should also start by defining uh, what do we want as Africans, right? So what type of uh, uh, continent that we want. Uh, and this, some of these things are outlined in uh, the African Union's uh, 2063 agenda that once Oh, uh, the, its vision is for a transformed uh, continent, right? So we have that vision. This is what we want, uh, and also we have, as Teresa mentioned, we have, we have, uh, we are blessed in terms of uh, people. So we have, uh, we have young people uh, who we should we should invest in those young people to make sure that they are able to deliver on uh, this transform the continent uh, that we want now. Um, if we look at the vision that we want and we look at uh, the human resources that we have, now I think what's, what's left in behind is that link, right? So now we need to ask ourselves, how are we uh, preparing our youth and to make sure that they are going to be able to contribute to the social uh, economic development of their countries uh, individually and also as a continent uh, as a whole. So I think this is where now it comes back to um, to us as educators, as uh, the people in, uh, in the education systems to make sure that we are educating the youth for the continent uh, that we want. So and now this is also coupled with uh, all these changes that are happening around the world. So. Um, the world is ever changing. Uh, you know, we talk about all these uh, these concepts, uh, this fourth industrial revolution, this digital economy, all these things. So, uh, but we also need to always ask ourselves: 
how are we making sure that we are preparing the youth for these changes, right? So, and uh, if you look at, uh, at the traditionally how we have been conducting the business of teaching uh, and learning, uh, mostly it's been um, we teach uh, we teach to test, right? So, uh, which means we'll come, uh, we'll, we'll consider that the teachers are, you know, the sole proprietors of the knowledge. They have the knowledge, they know everything. So they come in front of teachers and, you know, tell the kids what they need to know and then come back and say, you know, give me back what I told you. So, uh, but that, that that's not, uh, in my view, the way uh, that you should look at this if we want to be able to educate uh, young people are going to be able to adapt to this uh, changing environment. So, but we need to shift that and um, uh, teach to learn, right? So to make sure that um, uh, these students who are uh, sitting in front of us actually have potential of their own. Uh, so we need to be able to, uh, to, to, to build systems that will look at uh, these students uh, and be able to build on their strengths and to make sure that um, what they get out of, out of uh, education system is not just uh, uh, broad knowledge on chemistry or physics or all these other things, but to make sure that when, when they graduate, they are people who can think for themselves, they are people who can identify problems in, in their communities, and then use all these science or social sciences, all these things they have learned in, 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 uh, in, um, uh, in schools, and to devise solutions for those problems in their communities, right? So, and this is very important. Uh, but again, the challenge lies in how we deliver it, right? So we always talk about these 21st century skills. We talk about uh, uh, communication skills. We talk about uh, problem solving skills. We talk about all these things. But if we look at, but then again, the question that we always keep asking ourselves is, are our systems built to deliver those skills, right? So, uh, and this is not a question I have an answer for now, but this is something that we, we should always keep uh, reflecting on as, uh, as the people in charge of education systems in Africa. We need to make sure that uh, we are training uh, the youth, we are training people who are curious, we are building that type of curiosity, we are training this, this, uh, this young people to look at all these challenges that we have as a continent, uh, and then uh, everything else should be hinged on that ability or that willingness for these young people to be to to, to try and solve uh, these problems. So now, that will be on education. So, but then again, another question comes: uh, if this, if, if let's say, if we succeed at doing all of that, what do we do? with these people when, 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 they, when they graduate, right? So what opportunities are in place uh, to make sure that uh, what we have built in school, actually those, those, those solutions that these, kids, these people are able to develop, get actually developed and actually get to solve all these problems that we are talking about. So uh, one, one, one of, uh, I think we, we, we heard from someone who was uh, uh, talking about these edutech solutions, right? So now, during this uh, lockdown, we have tried many things. So uh, Suraj was telling us about a list of all these uh, companies that are, the, that, that, that are being developed. Uh, but another question comes, how many of those solutions have we integrated in our education systems, right? So how many of those solutions can we say uh, we have enabled them to scale, right? So this is, a, this is I think, an, an, I think an important question because uh, if you use this uh, EduTech example as, a, uh, as an example on what I was talking about, so it, mean, it means these solutions have been developed by young people who were trained enough, who understood the problem, uh, and then decided to take on the challenge. And that challenge being schools are closed, but learning must go on. So what can I do? So they sat down and developed 
these solutions, right? So which means in a way they have succeeded actually at answering some of these questions I was asking myself before, right? So, but now again, the question comes back to all of us here is, you know, that now that these people, that, that these young people have done their part, right? What do we do to make sure that we give them a chance to actually be able to solve these problems that they have tried to tackle? So uh, I feel like I'm asking many questions, more questions than answers. So, but I think uh, uh, this is something that we need to to keep reflecting on as a, as a continent because uh, we have different challenges. Uh, we have the people who could solve these challenges. So now we are in the middle, we have education systems that uh, should be designed to help these people get to the level where they should be able to solve these challenges, but also as a society, uh, oh. we also have that collective challenge to make sure that these young people are given a chance to excel at what they want to excel. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. I'm um, I'm sorry to say to our panelists and to our guests that we are out of time. I knew we were going to have a very good conversation today, but I really wasn't prepared for the breadth and the depth of the perspectives that we've heard. So I would like to extend one last heartfelt thank you to the Honorable Gaspard, to Teresa and Taraj, and to Siraj, sorry for sharing your perspectives with us today. Um, I'd like to thank all of our guests for joining us. I wish you a very successful conclusion to the conference and a very safe and prosperous 2021.